Um, but I'm going to do what I do in the clinic, actually, um, which is to sit there and just ask the question why. Because um, I think it's something that actually, as physicians, we don't do very often. Um, that slide that Victoria just showed about that path to the left, which is simple but wrong. Physicians like things to be simple, and we like to be told what to do most of the time. So I'm not going to get into this. There are people on this call who are far more expert in this. But you know, as you've already heard from Victoria, we're dealing with a family of, of disorders which are involve abnormal protein folding and the eventual reaccumulation in this sort of common, curious, fascinating structure, the amyloid fibrin. Now, as cardiologists, we see two predominant types of, of amyloidosis in the heart. The first is AL amyloidosis related to deposition of light chains associated with plasma cell dyscrasias. And, and until relatively recently, this, this was thought to be the most common type that we encountered. But I think what is now very clear is that actually the overwhelming majority of, of amyloidosis that we see in the clinic is caused by the deposition of transthyretin TTR. TTR, as you know, is, is a protein produced predominantly in the liver and occurs in, in terms of disease state in the heart in two major forms, in a familial form caused by mutations in the TTR gene. And in the familial form, we see this characteristic multi-organ disease affecting nervous system, the heart, muscle, kidneys. Um, what we, we do see particular genotype phenotype clusters. So there are particular mutations that seem to manifest almost exclusively with a neurological phenotype, particularly familial amyloid polyneuropathy. We see other mutations that present with a predominant cardiac phenotype and of course, there are variants which result in a more mixed phenotype. With regard to these cardiac phenotypes, there's one in particular, the V122i um, mutation or variant, which um, is probably underestimated in clinical practice. Um, we know that maybe somewhere between three, four, maybe as much as 5% of people of black African ancestry carry this variant. And I'll, and I'll come back to this, this variant later because I actually think this could be telling us something very interesting about the, the mechanism of disease in association with some of the hereditary forms of TTR amyloidosis. So the classical paradigm, the thing that we're taught as, as medical students and as cardiologists is that there are these two basic types. There's the familial form with this variable presentation, male predominance. Um, often neurological manifestations, as I've described, dysautonomia are prominent amongst them. And then there's what we used to call senile, or perhaps more um, <laughs> appropriately now, wild type TTR amyloidosis, where you get deposition of the native protein within the heart. This is, seems to be largely a disease of the elderly, once again, a male predominance, and predominantly cardiac with a few exceptions, for example, deposition within the carpal tunnel ligament. Now, the kind of patients that come to us to, cl to clinic are those who've already been diagnosed with TTR amyloidosis and are referred for investigation of their heart. We have very occasional patients who have a neurological presentation such as polyneuropathy and are referred to us with unex so-called unexplained cardiac abnormalities but the overwhelming majority are those who present with what appears to be isolated cardiac disease, sometimes with systemic symptoms that have been overlooked. Now, again, this is a classical um, thing that all cardiology trainees will know is that they were amyloidosis is associated with a particular form, a phenomenon on the electrocardiogram where you have small electrical voltages. Um, it's a little more nuanced than that. It's when you have small voltages despite the presence of a thick heart on cardiac imaging. So it's that disparity, which is the, if you like, the diagnostic red flag to disease. And that is certainly something that, that we, we see, but we also now recognize that that is actually a relatively late finding. And actually in some forms of TTR amyloidosis, particularly some of the familial forms, actually the voltages may be normal or actually increased suggesting that you have an increase in myocyte cell volume or mass. 
Uh, and that's one of those things, when I say writing in the margins, you know, the questions I ask myself in the clinic is, why does this person, person have evidence for left ventricular hypertrophy? So not storage, not deposition, but big cardiomyocytes. The classic pathology um, is, is marked by this infiltration, this deposition of amyloid fibrils between cardiomyocytes. And this classically gives you concentric thickenings, all the segments of the left ventricle, the right ventricle. It's usually what we call concentric, so it involves all of the segments of the left ventricle equally, but we do see so-called asymmetric patterns where the disease curiously can be very localized within the muscle. The valves, again, in classical descriptions are thickened, although that can be difficult to discern with any level of certainty on ultrasound. Another feature which is in all the textbooks is that this causes a, a so-called restrictive cardiomyopathy. In other words, the heart is, is very poorly distensible. And we can assess that using a variety of, of uh, non-invasive physiological uh, instruments such as echo, echo Doppler. But once again, we know that there is a full spectrum from no apparent abnormality in diastolic function to extreme stiffness of the ventricle. Oops. Just as a couple of examples, so what you see here is, is a, a transthoracic echocardiogram and you're seeing the left ventricle cutting cross section. So this ventricle is not that happy, it's not contracting very well and you see this concentric thickening. And another thing that we love to talk about when we're imaging the heart, the so-called echo brightness. The, echo, the heart is characteristically hyper-reflective, although again a dangerous sign and not that reproducible. Uh, this is when this is what we call an apical four chamber view where you see the two ventricles for some reason in adult cardiology we turn the echo upside down and back to front i don't know why but that's what we do so you see the two ventricles at the top of the screen here the two atria the atria are often enlarged myocardium again is thick and this is something which is very subtle but we can look at the deformation of the myocardium using echo but we by using a technique that we call speckle tracking where you take adjacent speckles and see how they move together and apart and actually what we often see is that in the basal segments deformation is poor but for some reason there's preservation of deformation at the apex and we have other ways of demonstrating this this is what's called a bore's eye image and here this represents the apex we have this preservation of contractility at the apex is unexplained but a characteristic diagnostic red flag for cardiac amyloidosis the why question, regionality of disease. Now in cardiac amyloidosis, um, that we're, we're in a sort of a renaissance of this. It, it's always been one of those things you learnt about to do exams, but didn't worry too much about in the clinic. But there are, there are now several Im important drivers in, in clinical practice, which are making us pay attention to this as a disease. And one of those is improved diagnostics. Uh, one of the tests that's made a huge difference is cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. So this demonstrates some of the same structural features I've, I've described to you on ECHO. So again, you see the two atria, the two ventricles. The ventricle is thickened, the right ventricle is also somewhat thickened, and the heart is very poorly contracting. But the major contribution this brings is the opportunity to interrogate the tissue substrate non-invasively using uh, contrast agents, in this case gadolinium uh, as a contrast agent, a paramagnetic agent. And what we see are very characteristic patterns of gadolinium uptake. So we see, often see this sort of very diffuse pattern and also this curious subendocardial pattern. My why question, why do you see subendocardial deposition in amyloidosis? A test which, an old test, which has transformed our ability to diagnose amyloidosis in the clinic is bone scintigraphy. Um, we've known from incidental findings for, for many years that we occasionally encounter patients who are having a bone scan for some other reason, metastatic cancer, whatever, and the heart lights up. So this is a calcium avid tracer and the heart is lighting up. And what we've learned is that this test seems to be close to 100% sensitive and specific for TTR-related amyloidosis. 
And indeed, it is so sensitive and specific that in the absence of any evidence for a plasma cell dyscrasia in blood or urine with free light chains, simply by doing a bone scan, if the scan is positive in the appropriate context, that's all we now need to do to make the diagnosis of TTR amyloidosis. Whereas before we would have had to do a cardiac biopsy. Another really important change, of course, is that this is potentially, potentially a, a treatable disease. And there's an enormous amount of activity, as Vittorio alluded to, about treatment options in both AL and TTR amyloidosis. In AL amyloidosis, we have highly effective chemotherapy now to suppress the abnormal cell clone and reduce light chain production. And if you can treat patients early enough, this has a, a significant impact on their longevity and also on their symptoms because simply removing that light chain clone results in an improvement in cardiac function and a reduction in cardiac biomarkers although the amyloid load may remain the same and that this if you like was is a classic example of toxicity in TTR the focus here is on what is thought to be the putative mechanism of TTR related amyloidosis which is dissociation of the TTR tetramer into the oligomers and monomers that um, were being mentioned at the beginning of this talk and it's felt to be these if you like these non-native TTR species mo misfolded monomers oligomers which reaccumulate as fibrils within the myocardium and when that, and there are variety of approaches now being developed for silencing or pre preventing TTR production within the liver or stabilizing the native te uh, TTR tetramer. And this is where the, the greatest excitement has been over the past couple of years is in, in a drug called Tofamidus, which sits in the central pocket of the TTR tetramer, that same pocket which, um, in which thyroxin sits, for example, and TTR is a, is a transport protein. And it stabilizes the, the tetrama, prevents dissociation. And in a randomized clinical controlled trial, reduced mortality by 30%. Now remember, this is, this is essentially a heart failure trial and any change of that magnitude is now very unusual in the modern era, particularly in a population with a rapidly progressive fatal disease with a median age of 75. For me, even more important is that it seemed to slow disease progression. So if we look at quality of life scores, these were relatively stable in those treated, but it deteriorated inexorably in patients in the placebo arm. The same in deterioration in six minute walk. So stabilization of disease was again, really quite dramatic. Um, and this also translated into a reduction in time to first cardiovascular hospitalization with heart failure. This is not the only um, agent which is being investigated. As I've said, there are now approaches using silencing RNA technologies or uh, antisense oligonucleotides designed to reduce or, or knock down completely TTR production within the liver. Now, these are currently undergoing trials in patients with cardiac amyloidosis, but have been shown to be effective in the neurological familial forms with polyneuropathy. And the final driver is that, of course, now that we have these tests, we go back and we start to find that actually the textbook description of the classical cardiac amyloid patient is maybe not quite so classical. We see other manifestations. So this is in a term which I really hate, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So patients who present with signs and symptoms of heart failure, but their ejection fraction is normal. Now this can occur in hypertension, obesity, but in this study from Spain, they took patients with so-called HEFPEF, performed DPD scanning and found that 13%, 13% had cardiac amyloidosis, which if translated into the pop general population would be an enormous number of people. We've also learned to say that the echo patterns are not necessarily classical. They can be very localized thickening, the low voltage ECG and so on. Patients may present with actually without heart failure, but actually with a stroke, with heart block, um, with valve disease. And indeed this, this population of patients with valve disease 
aortic stenosis in particular, we're now starting to see very high rates of patients with cardiac amyloid, 16% in this series, 6% in a surgical series. The why question here is, is this coincidence? Is it simply because it's an elderly population? Or is there a connection between the fact that the patient has significant valve disease and the fact that they also have myocardial deposition of TTR? Um, and the final thing, this is, this is something that um, is very topical for me today because I've been trying to defend Vamidis at a, at a nice hearing. But if you look at incidental findings this, in people having bone scans, you can see in this recent Australian study, maybe as much as four to five percent of individuals above the age of 85 with a positive scan. Is that disease? Well, they certainly have thicker hearts, so it, it probably is. So already I hope you've seen that there are many unanswered questions, but there, there are others, some of which are perhaps more relevant clinically, others which I think are very relevant to, to the people on the call here, the scientists. Should we be screening for TTR? How do we screen? Who do we screen? The purpose of screening is that the evidence from the Tefamilis trial, of course, is that the earlier you treat, the better is the effect. But how do we do that? Well, there's some suggestion that if we see patients who present with some of their, uh, their non-cardiac manifestations, we should be screening. And the classic one here is carpal tunnel syndrome or spinal canal stenosis, which can predate presentation with the cardiac abnormality by five, maybe as much as 10 years. So perhaps we should be screening that population. Another why question is why is it affecting the carpal tunnel ligament 10 years before they present with cardiac disease? Uh, we could screen them with DPD scanning um, to answer the how question, but of course, this is it's not a very expensive test, but it is there is some expense, and of course, it does involve exposure to radiation. Um, another why question for you is is why is this scan positive? I ask I ask my my amyloid coll colleagues about this all the time, and they say, oh well, it binds to the amyloid fibrils. Well, does it? Do we know that? Um, and why do we see? Some exceptions. Of course, the more we do this, I said it was 100% sensitive and specific. Well, if you look at the V30-MET neuropathy early onset presentation, actually we're starting to see people who have abnormal echoes but have a normal DPD scan. Here's another example of a, of a genetic subgroup who have thickening, they have an abnormal MRI, so they seem to have deposition of amyloid, but the DPD scans are negative. There must be a biological signal here which is telling us something about the biology of TTR amyloidosis. Another way of screening is to do genetic testing. Um, and this is something we, we have a large population of patients who present with thick hearts for other reasons. And um, we've recently done a genetic screen in these patients. We found perhaps as you'd expect a number that had the V122i. But if you look at the ages here, none of these patients had evidence clinically for cardiac amyloid, except this individual who was homozygous for the variant. She was Afro-Caribbean and female. What we really need are serum markers um, because that's the, really the only way in which you're going to do large scale screening of high risk populations. And we don't have any serum markers yet which are specific to TTR amyloidosis. This is an interesting uh, approach using a combination of, of known biomarkers. So actually measuring serum concentrations of TTR itself, which appear to be reduced. I'll, I'll be, um, RB um, retinal binding protein, um, which is also reduced, um, troponins, which are elevated, and BMPs, which are elevated. And in this population of patients with V122i, the combination of these things was very predictive of those who actually had cardiac am amyloidosis. So maybe we're going to be looking at combinations of, if you like, surrogate biomarkers. Why do we see this variable disease penetrance? Um, why is it a disease of predominantly elderly men? What is it different about the, the TTR pathophysiology or the hearts of elderly men compared to women? I mean, so why just the heart and the carpal tunnel ligament? And this issue, toxicity versus storage, uh, this is something if I suggest this to some of my clinical amyloid colleagues, they tell me to, you know, there, there, calm down, you're just a cardiologist, this is not a toxic disease. Well, okay, but I'll come back to that. In a second. With regard to the variability, this is what we see in 
all monogenic diseases and it's going to relate to genetic modifiers, epigenetic modifiers. And we have some evidence for sort of epigenetic effects with these geographic clusters, some evidence for genetic anticipation within some family pedigrees. Uh, this business about the, the, the importance of what happens to the cardiomyocyte in TTR. And this, this, is, this is looking at using MRI to assess the extracellular space and cardiomyocyte volume. And we see differences between AL amyloidosis and TTR amyloidosis. First of all, TTR amyloidosis, the hearts tend to be thicker. And if you look at the, the left ventricular mass is independent from the extracell volume. So the amount or the size of the cardiomyocytes, they're bigger in TTR than they are in AL amyloidosis. This is straying into to your territory. We've, you know, we've got experimental evidence that if you expose cardiomyocytes to TTR, and in particular modified forms of TTI, such as oxidized forms, then you see a toxic effect. You also see changes in cardiomyocyte biology. So you have abnormalities of mitochondrial function. You have the generation of oxidative stress within the cell. You have dysregulation of intracellular calcium. So this is a toxic effect. This has got nothing to do with the storage. And th this, uh, this interesting idea that what we're actually seeing is a complex interplay between the, the, the TTR itself, whether it be its abnormal structure, whether it be secondary modification of the structure, through oxidation or by changing side chains on the molecule, as well as changes in cell membranes, and in this instance, particularly the cardiomyocyte cell membrane, with changes in the cholesterol content and also, as has already been alluded to, uh, gangliocyte content. And this was a, a diagram I never actually finished, but I, I, I like this idea that what we're seeing is, yes, we see dissociation. Yes, we see the, this generation of, of non-native species, oligomers, etc., And these can accumulate as fibrils, but there's some evidence that they may be internalized into the cell and that they also have this interaction with the cell membrane resulting in the changes that I just described on the previous slide. Now, is there a, cl a clinical signal for toxicity? Well, I, I genuinely believe that there is. If you look at this subgroup analysis of the Apollo B study, so this was using patizaran. So this is knocking down TTR production in, in the liver. Uh, what you see is in the treatment arm, not only stabilization of this biomarker, N-terminal pro BMP, it basically tells you that the cardiomyocyte is under stress, but you start to see a reduction and that reduction begins almost as soon as you start giving the drug. So you're taking away some form of stress on the cell. I, don't, I cannot believe this is clearance of amyloid from the heart. And it's the same picture as you see with AL amyloidosis. And this is a completely wild idea. Um, but if you look at biobank registries and you look at Afro-Caribbeans with this familial variant, and look at the prevalence of heart failure with aging in individuals with this variant, it is dramatic. And this signal keeps coming back. If we look at heart failure studies, heart failure trials, 10% of, of Afro-Caribbeans in those studies carry this variant. Now, do they all have amyloidosis? Do they all have deposition? Or do they have some toxic effect, some pre-deposition phenotype? I don't know, you tell me. Sorry, okay. Just uh, five minutes. Okay, so uh, the, these last points, and there's like a last, largely clinical, but how do we stratify risk? How do we monitor? There are a variety of clinical stratification tools built around measurement of biomarkers such as BMP, renal function, and N terminal pro BMP. This is looking again at those non native species which seem to be elevating in patients with polyneuropathy but interestingly also seem to respond to therapy. And if, you, if you're a non-responder, you don't see such a knockdown in these non-native species, these oligomers, uh, which may give us a way of monitoring therapy and identifying people who are, best, who are most likely to um, respond to treatment. 
And this final point, again, is something that we're going to be moving into the future. Who should receive therapy? What kind of therapy should you receive? What is the role of conventional therapy? And this point is, what are we actually trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve stabilization or reversal or prevention? And the strategy will depend on what it is that we're actually trying to do clinically. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll probably stop there. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, do we have questions? Yep. So there's a question from Alexander on why is the heart so much more often affected by amyloidosis than other organs? I, I, I just don't know. So I mean, it's. Um, I think it has to have something to do with the, the tissue susceptibility. And that's why I showed that slide about changes in the cardiomyocyte membrane, which we know changes with aging. We know that the lipid content, for example, of the cardiomyocyte membrane changes. So there may be a susceptibility effect, um, but that there are others on this call who may have other ideas. Um, but I, I think another question which I didn't pose was about the circulating oligomers. Are they there all the time? You know, is this a failure to, to clear those toxic oligomers? Um, or are we producing them all the time? If we're not producing them all the time, is it something that happens with aging as maybe cell mechanisms? intracellular mechanisms for dealing with misfolded proteins deteriorate? I don't know the answer to those questions, um, but, but clearly there's something which changes in, the, in organ susceptibility with age. And, and heart changes more than other organs or? Which uh, more than other organs, but how do I connect the cardiac <laughs> ligament? <to> the uh -oh. <laughs> I really don't know, and except, you know, it's, it's interesting that the, I see a lot of people with other rare diseases and the other group of patients that I see a lot of carpal tunnel syndrome in are patients with mucopolysaccharidosis. So where the carpal tunnel again seems to be particularly susceptible as does the heart and as does valve tissue. So is there some commonality there in tissue susceptibility? I don't know. It's, it's not one of those questions why I always ask myself why. Why, why are my little patients with MPS getting a cardiac phenotype which if you squint a little bit, it looks a little bit like amyloidosis. Mm.